Hi everyone. In this lecture, we will be talking about DNA and chromosomes. First, what is DNA made of? DNA is composed of first, a sugar, in this case deoxyribose, and a phosphate. Together, we call that as the sugar phosphate. Next, it is also composed of a nitrogenous base, and together, the sugar phosphate and the base are called a nucleotide. There are four nitrogenous bases that are used in DNA, namely adenine, abbreviated by A, cytosine, abbreviated by C, guanine, abbreviated by G, and thymine. Together, these nucleotides come to form a DNA strand, which you can see here at the bottom. DNA in all cells are double-stranded, and these two strands run anti-parallel to one another. Aside from this, it also forms a double helix structure, which you can see in this figure. One thing we need to take note of is that DNA is polar. That means that both ends of the DNA are not similar to one another. Here we can see a single-stranded DNA in its molecular structure, and we can see that the nucleotides are held together by phosphodiester bonds, and this is the sugar phosphate backbone here. The phosphodiester bond is what you see here. It occurs between a phosphate and an oxygen. So speaking of polarity, the two ends of the DNA are different. First, we have the five prime end, which you can see here, and it's called the five prime end because it ends with the fifth carbon in the deoxyribose sugar, which is this one here. So if we count the number of carbons, we have one, two, three, four, and the fifth one is here. This is also known as the phosphate end. Then we have the 3' prime end, which is the third carbon in the deoxyribose. This is also known as the hydroxyl end. Now aside from the different phosphodiester bonds that hold our nucleotides together, the two strands in our double helix are held together by hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases, and we can see that in this figure here. Our nitrogenous bases, by the way, can be divided into two classifications. First is the purines, G and A, or guanine and adenine, and we also have the pyrimidines, C and T, or cytosine and thymine. The way you can remember is that cytosine and thymine both contain the letter Y in their names, and so does pyrimidine. Now, our different nitrogenous bonds form complementary base pairs with each other, and these base pairs are similar in all forms of DNA in cells, and those are pairings between cytosine and guanine, as you can see here, and thymine and adenine, here at the bottom of the figure. So these base pairs occur between one purine and one pyrimidine. And as you mentioned earlier, the strands are anti-parallel to each other. So in this figure, we can see that one strand is going in the five prime to three prime direction, and the other strand is going in the opposite direction. Together, our two strands form what we call a double helix, and in this figure, we can see a space-filling model of the different molecules that create our DNA. Per turn in the double helix, there are 10 base pairs, and in each turn, there are two main things that we can observe. First is what we call the major groove here, and this is the groove where most proteins can attach. Then we also have a minor groove. The reason why these are called major and minor is because the major groove creates a wider space compared to our minor groove, and this wider space allows for these different proteins. Now, DNA is very important in all cells because it is the mechanism for heredity. That means that DNA can be read and translated into biological material. We call this the genetic code, and these are combinations of DNA that correspond to the amino acids. Here we can see an example of the genetic code. Now the DNA is read and converted into amino acids through the central dogma, that is the process of transcription and translation, which we will be discussing in a future video. In DNA, there are regions that contain information to make proteins and other molecules, and we call these regions as genes. So again, these regions can create either proteins or RNA that can have some catalytic activity. Together, all of these genes may Next, let's talk about eukaryotic chromosomes. These are long strands of DNA that are packaged using proteins. 
In this figure, we can see an example of the different human chromosomes. There are 46 chromosomes in total, and these are divided into 23 pairs, which we can see here. 22 of those pairs are what we call homologous pairs or homologues of each other. That means that they are functionally the same, but there may be some slight differences in their nucleotide sequences, and those are numbered from 1 to 22. Aside from this, we also have two sex chromosomes, which are non-homologous in males, meaning they are dissimilar, X and Y. In females, though, our two sex chromosomes are homologous, X and X. If we take all of these chromosomes together, we have what we call the genome, which is the full set of chromosomes. Next, let's take a look at what chromosomes are made of. First, they are made of genes or regions that code for proteins and other products. In this example, we can see those different regions highlighted in yellow. Because they code for products, they are also known as coding regions. Aside from that, we also have non-coding regions, the ones in gray here in this segment of DNA. And they have other biological functions, or they have unknown functions that are still being researched today. Aside from coding and non-coding regions, there are also specialized DNA sequences that we can find in the chromosome, which are mainly used for cell division. The first of these are the different replication origins, and these are starting points for DNA replication. In a single chromosome, there can be multiple replication origins. Next, we have telomeres, which are the ends of chromosomes, and these are used to prevent damage to the ends of our different chromosomes. Lastly, we have centromeres, where the mitotic spindles attach. And as we can see in this figure, these different sequences are conserved in both interphase and emphase. Now in interphase and emphase, the chromosome can take on different forms. We have interphase chromosomes and mitotic chromosomes. These are actually the same DNA sequences, but they are packaged differently. First, we have the interphase chromosomes, which are extended long strands of DNA, and they are not distinguishable using the microscope. But we know that these different DNAs occupy certain regions of the nucleus, and we can see that in this figure where the different regions are color-coded. Meanwhile, in mitotic chromosomes, these are highly compacted and easily visualized using the microscope. Next, let's talk about how DNA is compacted. The most fundamental level of chromosome packaging is what we call the nucleosome, and we can see an example of that in this figure. The nucleosome is composed of DNA, around 200 base pairs in length, which we can subdivide into either linking DNA and wound DNA. Linking DNA can be seen here linking two nucleosomes together, and wound DNA is the actual DNA that is wrapped around the protein. And in this case, we call this protein as the histone protein. If we take just the histone and the DNA around it, we call that as the nucleosome core particle. This is composed of the histone, which is actually an octamer. This means that it is composed of eight different types of proteins, which we can see here at the bottom of the figure. Two copies each of histone H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. And we have the DNA around the histone protein, approximately 147 base pairs long. Together, they wrap around the histone around 1.7 times or 1.7 turns. The next level of DNA compartmentalization is called chromatin, and this is composed of a long string of nucleosomes and other DNA-associated proteins. In this figure, we can see the chromatin here on top, and if we stretch out this chromatin, we can actually see the individual nucleosome core particles and their linking DNA. Now the chromatin is tightly compacted by another histone which we call a linker histone. This is histone H1. Moving up, we can also organize chromatin into loop domains and these are done by a specialized non-histone chromosomal protein which we can see in green here. This yellow string here is actually the chromatin which is composed of our different nucleosomes. Altogether, we can see that DNA packing actually occurs on several levels in the chromosome. We start with the double-stranded DNA, and this DNA is wound around histone proteins to create our nucleosomes. 
Next, the nucleosomes are packed together in what we call chromatin fiber, and the chromatin fiber is further packaged into our loops or loop domains. And together, those domains make up our mitotic chromosome. Altogether, the cell has compacted our double-stranded DNA up to 10,000 times shorter. One caveat to the highly packaged DNA in our cell is that once DNA is tightly packaged, the proteins that need to access the DNA have a hard time reaching it. So the cell needs to find ways to alter the nucleosome, and this is used to make DNA more accessible. There are two main mechanisms for this. The first one are called the chromatin remodeling complexes, which we can see in this figure. These complexes locally alter the nucleosome arrangement. And we also have histone modifying enzymes, which allow for the attachment of other proteins onto our histones. Finally, let's talk about the ways that chromatin is organized in the interface. Even though it is not as tightly packed as that of the mitotic chromosome, there is still some organization that occurs within the cell at this phase. We have two types. First is euchromatin, and these are composed of more extended regions of DNA, which we can see in this figure at the bottom. These regions are extended because different proteins need to access these bits of DNA because they contain actively expressed genes. In other words, these genes are regions that are being actively used by our cell. Then we have heterochromatin, which are more condensed. And because of this high condensing of DNA, this causes the genes in these areas to be silenced. However, the cell can control these different regions by using the histone modifications that we discussed in the previous slide. All right, so that was all for our short lecture on DNA and chromosomes. If you wanted to read more on the things that we discussed, please check out these references. Thank you for listening. If you found this video informative, consider subscribing to our channel.